It's going to be really cool for smaller artists. I mean, think about going to a So Far show and you see someone where you're just like, oh man, they're, like, they're a really cool local band. I, I really like them. They could offer an NFT drop. All of a sudden you're actually paying them versus just streaming and they get paid four cents. The upside is, is huge for, the, for an artist like that. That's insanely valuable. Welcome to another episode of Built on Web3. Today's episode is a project deep dive where each week Thomas and I chat about a Web3 project that looks interesting. Interesting. We're both Web3 enthusiasts, just trying to learn as much as we can right alongside all of you. Today, we're doing a deep dive into the Web3 project Royal.io. Thomas, happy Friday. Happy How Friday. We doing? Good. So far, just so excited to talk about Royal. I even <laughs> actually talked about, um, so I had a bike ride this morning, and the guy I was talking to, Mike, he, he's an older gentleman. And he asked me the question, so what is blockchain? And I was like, oh, this is going to be a long conversation. And I was like, well, funny enough, the reason I have to actually get back pretty soon is so that we can chat about blockchain things. Yeah. Nice. What'd you tell him? Well, I was, um, before I could answer, uh, he was like, I think it's like a cryptographic series of things and you have keys and it's like a, everybody has a little piece of a database and so forth. And I was like a Excel. And I was like, yeah, that's, we're on the right track here. Pretty mm -hmm. good description for a 75 year old. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, he did, he did a great job. I was impressed. <laughs> Most people don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So. Um, so yeah, Royal, what we're talking about today, um, there, so I, I think I'm just going to go through kind of the basics and we can take it from there. Yep. There, so their one liner is a, Royal is a platform to enable anyone to own their favorite music alongside their favorite artists and participate in the financial upside with their favorite artists. And some of the basic points are they've raised $55 million, uh, mainly, I don't think from VCs, I think it was from Chainsmokers, Nas, and like famous musicians. Or maybe like Diplo, something like that. Yeah. Diplo, I think, was one. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. They started May 2021, so a year and a half old. Um, founded by Very this. Recent. I've, I've never heard of this guy, but DJ Blau, I think, is pronounced. Um, uh, yeah. He's the founder. <laughs> 3LAU. I don't know. He seems like a known guy. <laughs> he like I've has done shows with Diplo. So. <laughs> I've heard his music before. Yeah, I'm sure Definitely. I have too. But <laughs> yeah. Um, he he, yeah, he that dude studied finance in college and then became a DJ. So honestly, it's kind of like the perfect person to start something like this because he's like really into finance and crypto, but is also like a famous DJ. Yep. Um, but the founding team is stacked. His best friend started open door which mm -hmm. is a publicly traded company who is his co-founder his yeah. other friend was one of the founders of coinbase who is on the founding team oh um yeah. so if anyone's gonna succeed it's gonna be them that's just a an insane founding team <laughs> yeah it's a pretty pretty good sized founding team for sure <laughs> um yeah and the main problem they're solving that i could kind of dissect from all of the info out there is this problem that only record labels, hedge funds, and private equity funds are pretty much the only ones able to invest directly in music artists. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to, um, and so they're trying to, I guess, democratize that a little bit and allow fans to participate in the success of their artists and to invest in them early on. Um, and yeah, the way they're doing that is through li what, so what I like what they're doing is they're trying to abstract all this web three blockchain stuff. So they've basically just made up their own words for everything. So they call them limited digital assets instead of NFTs mm -hmm. to make it more approachable. So the solution here is that artists can come on and sell a song as a limited digital asset and, um, the things that they offer, so if you're the owner of this NFT, there's two things. You can get access to a percentage of streaming rights, mm -hmm. uh, streaming revenue, and then also whatever utility and benefits the artist adds on um, on top of that. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, we can dive into whatever, wherever you want to take this. Yeah. No, I, um, so as soon as I started reading more into this and, and researching it, 
I thought that this was actually very relevant to the first interview we had with Austin from mm-hmm. Kino. I thought that there was a lot of parallels here in terms of, but Kino is a little bit more structured and Royal seems like it is more so like the platform. They don't really take a cut. They just kind of let you do your thing, which was interesting. But I was still wondering if they had, um, if, if, if they were centralized in any way. I couldn't really get, we could talk about that a little bit later, but I couldn't really understand like what role they play. Uh, and if they are centralized in any way, if that what do you mean by centralized? It. Like, can so when we were talking about lens protocol, for example, that was very kind of like sensor resistant, like very uh, kind of you have a lot of freedoms with a project like Kino or with a project like Royal. Like, I wonder if they are as a central body if they can dictate what well, right now they obviously do dictate who joins their music, but can they un Royal someone um, if, at, like as an artist on there? I, I was kind of in, interested to kind of see if that was a, if that was a thing. Mm. Yeah. I mean the, there was an interview where the founder said that right now they're a really, really closed ecosystem because they want, they can't just open it up right now because they kind of have to prove that this is a real thing and that this is exciting yep so they're basically just using it seems like their connections so diplo nas did the i think some of the first two drops um this founder did a drop as well and it's they are choosing who comes on and does this yep i wonder if they have control over if they stay on to that or if it just becomes totally... Well, it's not a platform, though. So once I you sell the NFTs, true. the NFTs are out there on the blockchain, so there's you, you can't take those back, right? Yeah. They're, they're on chain. Um, one Because thing... it's not like they're like the artists aren't posting anything on Royal. Yep. So one thing that Justin said, one thing that Justin said in one of his interviews when I was kind of digging in, and I thought was so interesting, is that right now, artists, music artists, like in general really have no connection with their fans because he's like, if there's 50,000 people in a stadium, they do not know who any of those 50,000 people are. And I think about that as like, well, kind of, obviously, you know, they, they of course don't, but they, they've got to have, you know, maybe some connection. And I don't think they really ever had. And if they did through social media, like Instagram or Facebook or all these other kind of or Twitter platforms, it's always through an intermediary. So the Mm -hmm. fact, so I think what clicked for me when I was digging in was that, wow, like they have a direct link this time. Yeah. Like they know the wallet addresses. Yeah. Which is, they they have an identity to it. Yep. Um, This is almost like a step further than like the fan clubs, you know, when they have like kind of like the email addresses, they're like, Hey, ticket sales are going to go on now. Like this yeah. is that one step further, much further. But that's on the artist to like to build that email list, like yep. you were saying. Um, yeah, because they, they don't know who buys the tickets. They don't know who comes to their concerts. They don't know any of this yep. unless they spend the time to, to do that. Yep. And now all of a sudden, yeah, it is just like what incentive do you have to give an email address? <laughs> everybody yeah. collects. Yeah, everybody yeah. collects it versus now. Like, yeah. You, yeah, it's different. Yep. Well, let's look at um, kind of what some of these NFTs look like on Royal, just so we can see kind of the because the the main piece is sharing a, a percentage of streaming revenue. Yep. And then the second piece is you also get additional benefits, but that's totally and both of those are totally up to the artist to decide the yep. details on. Yep. Um, so let's look at, I mean, looks like this most recent one, Elefante. I don't know if he's famous or not. <laughs> uh, seems like he is. So he did a drop that is sold out. Um, he had, was offering two types of NFTs. They called them platinum is the lower tier and diamond is the higher tier. Um, with the platinum, they list a percent ownership per token, Mm-hmm. Um, and on diamond, it's higher. So if you own the diamond, you pay a thousand dollars and you get 0.8080% ownership 
of streaming revenue of this song. Um, and I don't know if that's percent uh, of a hundred percent of revenue or if that's percent of the percent that they can share. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, cause I know he was talking about how some artists have record deals and they only get 20% of the streaming revenue mm-hmm. and the, the record label gets the other 80. Uh, so, um, but I think they've been trying to do a lot of independent artists right now, um, yep. so that they can share more. Well, I, I saw, um, so Justin in one of his interviews said that he was working very closely with Spotify on like mm-hmm. how to make this all work. But then also if you go to Royal's page as an artist, if you sign up, like one of the questions they ask is, do you own a hundred percent of the rights? Yeah. Um, just cause I gotta imagine it's a whole lot easier if you just own everything. You don't have to, but yeah, there's a lot less red tape for an early yep. concept like this. So much easier. Yep. Yeah, and so here's a list. So if you pay, if you buy this thousand dollar diamond NFT, here's a list of all of the benefits. And I think this is where artists will be able to get pretty creative. Um, so my guess is we're just seeing kind of the the first stab at artists getting creative with extra benefits of NFT owners. So mm-hmm. uh, first one is that Elefante is doing is they'll host a virtual event exclusive only for holders of this NFT. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll also get access to tickets with a meet and greet for a live show or virtual performance that you can only redeem once. Um, and then I guess there's some details with like not including travel, blah, blah, blah. Um, assigned jersey and bandana, claimable mm-hmm. ones for NFT holders, exclusive access to unreleased tracks. I think that's really cool. Uh, if you're a huge fan of an artist and they have unreleased tracks, all of a sudden you can, you know, you can share those with your NFT holders because it is kind of secure because if that gets leaked, they know exactly who leaked it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, maybe we watched the same thing, but that, that was a cool thing too, yeah. is because the, they, they can prove who leaked it and all of a sudden there's repercussions for that <laughs> leaker. Yeah. Yep. That, that's cool. Um, pre-sale access to merch drops. So that's definitely a really cool thing for big fans. Uh, you can get early access to shirts and, uh, merch and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the obvious web three stuff is getting in a discord that is private to NFT holders. Mm-hmm. And then what also I think is cool is priority access to their next drop on Royal. So if you're, if you already hold one of these NFTs, you get priority access to the next one. That's cool. I wonder if there's a way, like how how do these are like are these in a smart contract? These benefits right here, or how are they enforced or maintained? Yeah, I don't and- think I don't think so. Um, these are just like the extra benefits because mm-hmm. in a smart contract, you can only put in things that are programmable and yep. pro- provable on yep. chain because you can't edit that contract afterwards, right? Yep. Um, I, so I wonder. So that, yeah, if they ahead. if they do this though, um, how do you know like that they uphold these benefits and and, and like it is it is or is do people just like spread word of mouth of being like hey they don't include that or is this what you're going to show me now? Uh, no, I'm assuming that's what's in here. Um, I know Royal p- uh, publishes all of their legal documents mm-hmm. and all of the legal documents are actually linked in the smart contract. Oh, so my guess smart. is that the answer is they probably cannot guarantee yep. that the artist will send you the signed hat, but I don't know. I'm not sure if there's like a legal guarantee there or not. Well, besides the legal guarantee, it just might be interesting of being like, Hey, this person hasn't delivered on what they sold. Like mm-hmm. what, how, I wonder how word would spread or would that leave a mark or what that would kind of do for that artist. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and then the the other NFT that Elefante has is the lower tier, so this is only $100. And what you would get with this is exclusive access to unreleased tracks, um, pre-sale access to merch drops, Discord, and priority access to the next drop, mm-hmm. and, uh, and a lower percentage of streaming revenue. Um, that is kind of crazy that you could own almost 1% of the streaming revenue of a song. 
Yeah, it's crazy. So here's yeah, here's some more info. It says tokens for this track are based on historical streams and the performance of comparable songs in Elefante's catalog. For every three million streams, we estimate that token holders will make approximately ten percent of this token's primary price, assuming a point zero zero four one per dollar per stream. Ten percent of the token's price. So how much is the primary price okay so there's so if you buy if you buy the thousand dollar token they're estimating based on historicals token holders will make 10 percent of that so a hundred dollars you'll get in is their estimate in streaming revenue it's a lot lower than i thought it would be so hold on do that do that math again so you get is so the point eight percent that you get are you getting 0.8% of the token or is the 0.8% the token? No, no, no. Um, the token is a 0.8% ownership okay, in gotcha. the streaming revenue. Gotcha, it's, gotcha. It's, like, it's like if you were owned a share in a company, yep. you would own 0.8% of the company. Okay. But the math is lower than I thought. So it looks like you only they're estimating you're, you're only going to make 100 bucks. Which I guess is kind of cool. Well, you couldn't make that before, but I guess so it's a hundred. So they're so they're saying for every three million streams that they're going to make ten percent of that token value. Yes. Okay. That's fair. Okay. Yes. You're right. So so if they so if that strong gets streamed thirty million times, you'll basically get zero zero for zero then. Yep. Yeah. So I guess how many streams would they need? Sorry, if you just said that. How many streams do they need? To break even. 30, 30 million. 30 million streams on that one song. Yeah. Does Spotify show you? I don't know. Yeah. Do you, do you have Spotify? I don't. Does it nah. show you stream numbers? Yeah, I could. Hold on. Let me pull it up. on. Oh, here's catching on. It's at 39 million streams. Already? Hold on a second. Let me. What, who? Yeah, 39 time? million streams. So, um, So that's possible, actually. Let's see, Elefante catching on thirty nine million. Yeah, nice. He has seven hundred monthly, seven hundred. And, and that's the other weird things. thing is yeah. that they didn't. He didn't release this song on here. The mm -hmm. song's been out for years. Interesting. So it's just right. the moving forward. Yeah. So okay. They, so so it in might this, take a I long think, time. Yeah. In this case, I don't. I guess I don't know where. Uh, maybe they just draw a line on a, on a date and say from this date forward we count the streams. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I was explaining this to to Mike on my earlier bike ride, and he gave me a really good question. I was like, I'm going to ask this question to Sean because it's a good one. <laughs> um, and he said, Okay, well this sounds really cool because I explained to being like, Hey, so the, the the money from the streams comes in, and then you get a portion of that. Uh, but I said, the cool thing about this is that there's a smart contract that automatically directs that money versus it going to Elefante's bank account and then Elefante distributing it. I think at least that's how I understood it from one of the explanations I think that Justin had. And then he asked, well, so what bank account does it go to and how do you know that's for sure? Like, like that is actually, you know, going to. Uh, like, how do you know that Spotify is really depositing a thousand dollars into this? Yeah, so it's actually a common like, misconception. Royalties are not enforceable on chain. Mm, interesting. So there's actually it's actually impossible to enforce royalties in a smart contract, and everyone thinks that it is. You're actually relying on the marketplace. So open C. Yeah. So anytime there is mm -hmm. a if you res if you resell a board ape and they take two point five percent, that's not in the smart contract. That yep. is, um, I think they they might that's identify in the smart that in the contract smart contract on the market, but it's up to the marketplace it, to enforce yeah. it. Yeah, but, um, and there there was this big like scandal or thing that happened where a NFT marketplace came out with zero royalties, mm -hmm. and so I think people were like taking advantage of that because they yep. weren't doing royalties. Yep. Um, which is crazy. But in this case, I want to correct what you said. So the um, so making payments, so the reason why why blockchain for this is making payments to thousands of people on chain is like 
10,000 times easier than doing it through banks. I agree. A hundred percent. Yep. Um, but the artist is responsible for distributing that money. So okay. the artist does get the money oh. and right. And, and he said this in an interview too, where he said right now they're just, they're hand holding artists. Like they are, because it is a confusing process. So they gotcha. are very much hand holding artists through this process where they get the money and they work with them and the percentages and all that, that money is sent to a smart contract. And then that money is claimable only by people that own the NFT in their wallet. Okay. And Royal's whole mission here is to abstract all of this stuff um, so that you don't have to. So even... right now it's a little manual, but they will make it. Yeah. Which I think eventually. is the, is the, per, is the way to approach this. Like, if you don't have a Web3 wallet or, or a crypto wallet, you can still participate as a fan and yep. not have to deal with setting any of this up. They'll set yep. a wallet up for you in the background, Yep. and then you can like figure it out later, which so I think have is amazing. Yeah, you have the money. So, it's even, so you could even be accumulating money. You just don't have access to it yet because you haven't set it up. But once you do, you do yeah. have access yep. to it, which is... And they'll even like set it up for you. So it's really cool yep. how... They understand how hard this is right now, and they're just trying to be the abstraction layer. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. So, what you said about, um, so that was, so I was talking about like stream royalties, and then we were talking about the royalties of like reselling that ownership. So, yeah, that was the other thing that I learned on here was maybe we watched the same interview where I didn't know that you don't need to pay royalties when you sell your. NFT or whatever that is, but it totally makes sense. And the reason that it's not enforceable is because what happens if you want to change wallets, you know, or you want to Mm -hmm. move something, how can you tell as like a vendor or the original, you know, minter of that NFT that that wallet does or doesn't belong to you, Uh, which is really, so that's really interesting that. Yeah. And I don't know the specifics of that, of that royalty thing. Because that percentage has to be defined somewhere, mm-hmm. right, in the NFT like or, or the project. Like the, somewhere it is written in code that Board API Club takes 2.5%, but I don't know where that is and why it, it's signif- enforceable by might, some marketplaces. Um, maybe they mark down the marketplaces, you know, so like, hey, if if opens if this is on open seas this is where it happens and so but that could be an interesting thing to to dive into more but but it totally makes sense because like once you have that on a like you can think about it this way too like if you have a wallet like a hardware wallet how can you move it from uh is it called on chain like a, mm-hmm. not a cloud wallet is it an on-chain wallet cold wallet cloud? cold yeah so how do you move it from there to or no how do you move it from online to like an actual hardware wallet yeah uh i mean they're the same right like your cold wallet like this this ledger mm-hmm. the wallet is on chain all this is doing is storing my private keys gotcha right it's still like the wallet address is on on the blockchain. It's just oh, okay. Um, that the only reason for that is just keeping your private keys safe. Gotcha. So, um, so what was interesting too? I, I thought of okay. So they're selling these you know percentages right here. They're these tokens for you to have these rights. Um, so I was wondering is like what if businesses or what if individuals even just buy up all of it and then they just like hold it too that could be interesting of like all of what just all the tokens they buy up all the the rights um could i i would they be back in the same place of just having big businesses still owning you know. Oh well, so the yeah, so the artist isn't giving up 100 percent ownership of Correct. these streaming royalties. It's up to yep. the artist to decide what percent of streaming royalties to give up. Yep. So let, so for an artist, let's say they own 100 percent of their streaming. There's no mm-hmm. record label or whatever. They're independent. 
they can decide I'm going to sh- give up 50% of those streaming royalties mm-hmm. um, to share with the NFT holders. So even if somebody bought up all of them, they would just get 50% of the royalties, yep. which my guess is that math would not work out because that'd be like 50, I don't know, it'd be a lot of money unless they like hit, unless they nailed it and, and the song went insanely popular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that could be like an interesting aspect of, I bet you businesses will like, there will be connoisseurs like of this area and like specialists that mm-hmm. will just s- snatch that up and that'll become their business. Um, yep. So it, it, and I think it's, it's going to be, it's going to be really cool for smaller artists too. Absolutely. Um, because like, I mean, think about going to a so far show and you see someone, um, where you're just like, oh man, they're like they're a really cool local band. I, I really like them. They could offer an NFT drop, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're actually paying them, versus just streaming and they get paid four cents. Like the upside is is huge. Yep. For the for an artist like that, because you can say, oh yeah, I'll buy an NFT and get a, a shirt for that, and maybe access to a free so far show or something. Um, that's insanely valuable. Well, I, I remember just like from the small artists, I, like the, I came across Kip Moore, um, which I know you're not the biggest fan of country music, but still growing on you. Um, but I came across Kip Moore on YouTube and the few songs that he had on YouTube only had a couple thousand, like maybe 10 or 14,000 views. And then by the end of the next year, I think it was in the hundreds of thousands. And it was so cool to, to kind of see that. And so um, one of my notes was, it's going to be so interesting to see the first celebrity artist mm-hmm. start small, but through like the, this whole NFT kind of like Web3 world and then yeah. actually grow popular. It'll be cool to see the first fan get rich off of that. That'll also be cool too. <laughs> right. Like if, if, if at that time Kip Moore said, Hey, I'm doing this NFT drop 500 bucks. You probably would have done it. I, if it, if it was like, his, if yeah. it was access to two shows backstage, oh, yeah. you would have been like, yeah, let's do it. I would have totally done it. Yeah. Um, who knows how many streams, uh, he um, has a lot of streams. This is a guy that sings something about the truck that you love making oh, fun yeah. of. It's the, it's the most stereotypical song you can, uh, you can think of let's see how many streams he has now wow so he has two and a half million monthly listeners something about the truck 165 million streams um, yeah that's crazy pay pretty girl the bull these yeah you could have made some money 90 that. yeah i could have made some real money i could have been that i could have been that guy or gal <laughs> that's so cool um so when they said and you said this already they call these tokens like an asset class i wonder why they chose to call that because that immediately wait what do you mean asset class uh like this is a new asset class you say or like a digital asset class no 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 no. so the the term they're using is limited digital assets okay asset is just something you own right it's yeah he didn't say it's a new asset class i don't think I thought he said that in a in an interview somewhere, and when he said that, I was like, "Ah, oh, like it's interesting that he's calling it that because that just begs for the SEC to get involved somehow." Oh uh, no, they're, I think they're attempting um, to just like this is their whole mission of abstraction. They just mm-hmm. don't want to use the term NFT because people freeze up and get confused and don't want to do it. Yep. So instead of saying, I don't even think the word NFT is on their website, on their homepage. Yeah, it's not. Um, and the reason is, is just what I said, is it, it kind of confuses people. So instead, they call them limited digital assets, which is an NFT. Yep. That's all it is. Yep. Yeah, they're very smart. They're yeah. very smart about how they're doing this. Um, which we've said that before. I don't think NFT is going to be the word that we're going to be using in five years. Yep. We're going to say on-chain, we're going to say digital asset, all that stuff. Yep. Um, So one thing that was said in some of his interviews and also on the website is that the statement that when fans own music, uh, how much more likely are they to share that Mm. song and become fans and invested of it? 
And I think that's really good marketing, but I think that's also a really big assumption because like how, especially as this becomes more popular, you're not going to be owning almost a percent of a song for a thousand bucks. Like, I, I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be more like, like a super small percent and it might be like 10 or $20. Like if you did spend 10 or $20, would you really, I, I think that's a big speculation and just assumption of like, Hey, I'm going to care so much more. Uh, mm. I might be totally wrong with it. it and maybe people will, but I, I don't know if it's fair to say right off the bat, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think people, like if you're like that one NFT we just looked at was a thousand dollars. If I was a thousand dollar NFT holder and my favorite artist, I think I would, you know, be more likely to add that to a playlist or, or mm -hmm. when it comes on, you know, I'll be like, oh, guy, okay, like I own part of this. Like mm -hmm. I just made money because we listened to this. Yeah, that's kind of that's pretty cool. Maybe kind of interesting brain blast that just happened was what if there are groups that end up forming like a small fan group that all pitch mm -hmm. in like a community pool to buy a, like i how yeah that'd be interesting too yeah i mean they're part of the nft holders is they get access to private discords so mm -hmm. it'd be, um so i guess you could be like they could form a dao and to be in the dao you have to be an nft holder mm-hmm and then they could maybe pool together to purchase maybe like an insane NFT that one of the, like a big artist drops. It's like $20,000 for 50% of a song or something insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that'll be cool. Um, what do you think are some of the things that we'll see happen because of this that are just like wild or unexpected? And by this being royal becoming popular and artists really kind of diving into this hey i have my own private community i've i can share revenue and money and kind of become partners with fans what do you think is yeah. something crazy that'll happen i don't know i think it just opens up the in-person experiences more you know like gary mm -hmm. v did it really well with his v friends so not necessarily conferences like he did vcon but artists could do like they're in Denver and they could, you know, ping the discord and say, Hey, I'm in Denver. If anyone wants to do a meet and greet, mm -hmm. come to this bar. And only the NFT holders know that. Yep. Um, that could be cool. They could do conferences, I guess. I don't know why they would, but, um, yeah, I think just the in-person stuff, but I think there's a, there's another project I haven't looked too much into. I think it might be sound.xyz or maybe it's a different one, but I think this is going to unlock other layers of ownership. So I think they're only starting with streaming rights and then whatever add-ons the artist wants to do like merch, but you can also do IP ownership of all the other aspects of music making. Like one of the other um, tools that we can cover at a different time. I think they make, um, I'm, I don't, I don't know how music's made. I can't think of the word, but it's like the little loops or like the beats or something like whatever mm -hmm. the like artists will make a beat and they'll, mm -hmm. they can make that an NFT. And then that can be tracked in any, like if any user, any artist wants to use that in their song, then that creator of that beat would get a royalty. So I think this will unlock like all the other layers of music making and how fans can participate in that. Wow. Yeah. This, so this could go a lot of different layers deep here because we yeah. can go into like, we're starting with streaming, but we can go into songwriting. We can go into, yep. uh, we can go into like maybe the artists actually being the business in the first place. So like, Hey, I'm, you're getting a, like a, a piece of me almost. Yep. Um, similar to like how venture capital backs different businesses. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how this compares to, like you said, like Kino. So mm -hmm. Kino is basically what it sounds like. They haven't like launched, launched yet, but it sounds like you can get access and early ownership in a filmmaking process through the whole process, right? Yep. Through script writing, whatever. 
but this they're starting with a very specific thing that they know is easy and works and then yeah. they'll expand so i wonder which approach will be better in web3 this one honestly i kino i think is great this one seems easier yeah it's starting with a very specific thing yep and then they're like okay let's make this work and then we can expand is it the word skeuomorphism is that uh, mm-hmm. is that the word this is a much more skeuomorphic approach if that mm-hmm. is proper english um because it's 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 basically taking the thing that currently exists and only ever so slightly changing it but yep. in a way that still unlocks all the benefits of being on that platform yeah i mean if they open this up to like the songwriting process or to artists to do whatever they want honestly mm-hmm. Like an artist can release an NFT for a song that does, is an untitled song, doesn't even exist yet. Yep. Um, they can release songwriting NFT or whatever. Get them in the Discord, and they and they just include the their fans as part of that process. Mm-hmm. So they could write a, a verse and say, "Hey, what do you think?" And then the fans can contribute, and maybe like one of their contributions actually makes it into the song, yep. which would be really powerful as a fan to to see That'd your words cool. in their song. <laughs> It'd be funny if, um, uh, you know how it's, I've noticed it being a little bit more popular now, how they start naming like items in songs. Um, what do you mean? Th- I, so there's a bunch of country songs and they name, uh, like Natty for like natural light. Uh, is it Arby's? Or, oh yeah, uh, you know which one Applebee's. I'm talking about. Yeah, Applebee's. Yeah, they name Applebee's, or they name uh, Heidi hates the song, but I love it. Um, Sand in my boots uh, by Morgan Wallace, and he uh, he talks about the Silverado, mm-hmm. and it's it's just interesting. Like it, it, artists could almost auction off of being like, hey, businesses, what do you want here? And have that direct relationship. Yeah, or too. even fans. I'll put your or, name. Or fans too. Like, yeah, they'll they'll say Sean Crow in, in the na- in the song. You how, pay ten thousand dollars. How many times <laughs> have you been to a concert and the artist puts in that city name that they're touring at into yep. the song? You know. Yeah, that they could be... put your name at a live concert if you're the gold NFT holder. Yeah, that would be so cool. Or, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it would be so interesting to have you know how the, like the cities kind of compete for which song is actually or which city name is actually going to be in that song. Mm-hmm. Um, but even uh, yeah, even even at live, I thought you were talking about live concerts. Oh yeah, even at live concerts, they say like, "Hey Denver," you know, but instead they'd say like, "Shout out to Thomas." Groshinsky and Sean, my two platinum NFT holders, mm-hmm. and all my other gold NFT holders. That'd be yep. pretty cool. That would be very everyone cool. would want to be one of would want to own an <laughs> NFT after that. Yep. Um, what was oh so? Uh, I don't know if you got into it, but it's interesting that this is all built on the Polygon network, and so this idea of them expanding into songwriting or others is cool because and and they have a very international they have like a no borders type focus here um because they're they're really kind of emphasizing on you know people from other countries and so the reason that they chose polygon was because of the costs associated with transactions and redeeming and then the Mm -hmm. gas fees and so the the kind of thing that we've talked about before too was the micro transactions are going to become very key and something that's low cost like polygon is going to be great for that yeah i was surprised how in the interview he was like yeah maybe I mean, the interview i think i think was in april he was mm-hmm. saying oh yeah maybe after the merge um we'll build on eth mainnet which like just totally surprised me because that is not at all what's gonna happen like it, it's just it shocks me that he thinks that the merge is going to reduce gas fees it is is not happening it's not part of the plan <laughs> yeah the yep. gas fees will probably not change at all from the merge it's yep. just more transactions per second and they are a a roll-up centric roadmap for ethereum like they don't necessarily want people to build on mainnet 
So yep. I was surprised that he said that. Maybe he just doesn't know what he's talking about yet. But Maybe he was, was also saying script. that it's, it, what's that? Maybe it was off script. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, so yeah, it makes sense that it's on Polygon. Polygon's super easy to mint NFTs on, mm-hmm. super easy to build on. So that's not surprising. But I was surprised that he was like, he's also a big Solana person. He didn't seem like sold on on Polygon. It kind of sounded like he was, no he, no, he said it was a short-term solution, which surprised <laughs> me. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see. Um, from a business model perspective, I couldn't, did you get much clarity into how mm. they make money? Because mm-hmm. he, the only thing I found was one comment he had in one of his interviews where he said that Royal uh, only takes part of the primary sale. Ah. And then after that, the artist gets to keep all the secondary sales and that happen, which I thought was cool that they don't kind of add a royalty on top of the initial, you know, they yep. kind of chain there. So I thought that was very nice. Um, of them. Yeah. So, ba- so my guess is then they just take a percentage when you, cause you can buy these with your credit card. You don't need a, a wallet or anything. So my guess is when you buy that thousand dollar token, they get 10 bucks or something. Yep. Yeah. It's funny. Royal has themselves become the ticket master in the web three world here where they get to sell once or sorry, Royal themselves has become the artist, uh, in the current world where the artist gets to sell a ticket once and then they never see money from that come in again. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And now the artist gets to be the ticket master where they get a a piece of the transaction every single time. Honestly, this is going to be a massive, like they're going to be huge. Royal is. They're going to make so much money. Well, I wonder how many of these are actually going to to make it because there's so many different competitors to royal too like which one is going to be the one of the three or two or something like that based on that founding team it's got to be royal (laughs) (laughs) if they don't succeed (laughs) who would (laughs) yeah that's true with open doors and Coinbase and everything like that, yeah, like blah, blah, blah. yeah, and the and the, the fact that this guy's a famous DJ and yep. you know the, <laughs> he's been in this for a, a while, like yeah, I guess it. Yeah, so like for example, let's see, um, the chain smokers five thousand tokens. Oh, they did this one for free though. Okay, hold on, I'm trying to see like what, how much revenue is being generated by these. Nas, did he do his for free? No. Okay, so Nas sold eleven hundred tokens. Oh my god! One of them is ten thousand dollars. What? So they said that one of these sales, I think it might have been Justin's or Three Laos or Blau's, however you pronounce his name. Um, they sold. Uh, they thought that they were going to get like ten or a hundred thousand dollars. They made eleven million, almost twelve million dollars. That's nuts. Uh, yeah, and in, in, in sales. Yeah, so yeah, for ten thousand sure. dollars for Nasas, you can get one point six percent ownership in that song. Wow. That's wow. nuts. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, oh, you can see all the collectors on here too. That's cool. But I was tra- I was trying to do the math. Oh, amount raised. There it is. Um, so for this Nas one, he sold eleven hundred tokens. He gave up fifty percent streaming royalty. That's cool. They put this breakdown on the website. And he raised three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. That's cool. Not bad. And that's like directly to the artist. Like Nas just made like three hundred k on a song that's already been out for a year. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And gave up fifty percent of the streaming royalties. So I wonder what that math is for him. So but it's it's sure. a giveth and a taketh, right? You, yeah. you it's, it's almost loyalty. like a loan, but it's the thing is is that he's kind of helping foster. He's building an engine engine that kind of helps foster the next kind of sound. So that's a very interesting business play. I um I thought about this could be a cool business idea actually. Is because everything is public, like on uh, is to see if they're like what type of data analytics can you derive from different trends so that you can spot what a trending artist, like depending on how quickly the 
um, the tokens get sold and all this other stuff, how that could become a driver to kind of saying, Hey, this is, this is on that projection to, mm. to actually blow up. That could be really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause all of a sudden you have these analytics that were previously never possible, not because they were closed, which is also its own separate thing. But the fact that you, uh, these transactions never took place because they weren't possible before. Yep. Yeah, and kind of like we were talking about with Dan from Metadime, mm-hmm. like as an artist, you can now see wallets of uh, people that hold NFTs from other artists. Yep. I don't know what that really does for you because it's not like a competitor, but I feel like that unlocks something. Yep. I w- yeah, the someone will create some sort of like messaging thing, you know, in between wallets. I hope yeah, that's I mean, I, yeah, not I think you're right. Way to become like a spammy thing that'll freaking suck. Too. It'll happen in wallet, I think. Like there mm-hmm. there I think there are some wallets out there. I I haven't dug into this, but wallets are basically going to become our inbox because as if you hold a NAS NFT holder, you still have no way to not, if you're NAS, no way to communicate with that NFT holder unless they're in the mm-hmm. discord or something. So I think some sort of wallet notification inbox system mm-hmm. will be a thing. Cool idea. Um, when we talked about lens protocol and we talked about the different filter filters, um, remember that? And, mm-hmm. and how all of a sudden these like parental controls or whatever we want to call it, you have, you can choose which one you want or you can build your own or customize it because it's all accessible. It'll be really interesting with these inboxes all of a sudden. Now you could really filter in who do you allow to send you messages uh, yep. and what are those classifications? So this next level of, you know, being yeah there there will be so many businesses that just create filters uh with different levels and features yeah i mean that'll be email campaigns right now are a thing but wallet campaigns or whatever it's called in five years will be a thing they'll someone will create the mailchimp for wallet notifications or whatever this and then how do you how do you decide of being like, Hey, I only want to have messages delivered from me from people that have X amount of transactions, you know, or mm-hmm. X mentors or, or, cause that could be really cool. So that you say like, Hey, I actually don't want to be solicited to by yeah. any artist that has less than 5,000 kind of yep. things or maybe only under, or if someone sends too many messages to, or however that they might be a spammer. <laughs> I guess you can have an infinite number of wallets. So yeah, spammers will find a way. Uh, Marketers always find a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, that is all I have on Royal. Do you have anything else? Nope. I think we took all the, the notes. I think the one thing I, I didn't really understand was that whole centralization piece. But right now, it's so I think it just came down to that they centralize and kind of pick and choose and are closed at the very beginning of like who becomes. Mm-hmm. But once you're there, once you're in, I think you, or, and once you've sold tokens, you for sure can't un, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, it'll somewhere. be cool when they open up yeah. the ecosystem to, to artists to sign up um, yep. as a do-it-yourself type of deal. Uh, that'll be yep. really cool. Yep. Sweet. That's all I got. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, this is a good chat. <laughs> <laughs>